wow, it got, it got quiet all of a sudden. Look at that. It's like uh, I walk up and it gets all quiet. So hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, good afternoon for anyone who doesn't know me, and I suspect most of you do. My name is James Herbert. I'm the president of UNE, and welcome to UNE's annual event honoring the life and the work of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This gathering represents really one of the highlights of the academic year here at UNE, and I'm really happy that everyone could, could join us. And uh, I'd also like to welcome the members of our community who are watching on the live stream from our Portland campus as well as from our campus in Tangier, Morocco. So welcome to all of you as well. And I want to offer a special welcome to our four panelists today, whom we'll be learning more about shortly. We're deeply honored to have each of you with us today, so thank you so much for coming out and spending your time with us. Each of you, in your own way, makes an important difference in your community and serves as a role model for the rest of us, and we look forward to learning from your wisdom. So again, thank you very much for joining us. So today we commemorate the historic visit of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who came to this campus in 1964. Nearly 59 years ago, Dr. King spoke right here on the grounds of our precursor institution, St. Francis College. This was less than a year after his famous I Have a Dream speech, and it marked his only visit to Maine. In that same year, he would win the Nobel Prize and be named Time Magazine's Man of the Year. Arriving in Biddeford on a beautiful day in early May, Dr. King found an overflow crowd awaiting him in the DeCary Gym. He spoke about the dire need to end racial segregation. He spoke about the racialized inequality in America and the need to ensure that all Americans had equal opportunity to lead happy, successful lives. He spoke of his dream, his aspiration, that America might one day be a truly colorblind society in which the color of one's skin is irrelevant to one's legal or political status or one's socioeconomic opportunities. He encouraged students and all people of good faith to stand up and make a difference in their home communities. Dr. King deeply inspired the people he met that day, and his work continues to inspire us today. We are very proud to carry forward his mission, encouraging UNE students to engage within their communities in the continuing fight for justice and equality. Our Biddeford campus has changed over the past 59 years, but our devotion to inclusion, diversity, fairness, and justice has not wavered. Through the generations, we built a consistent identity of extending educational opportunities to those marginalized by society. Indeed, this commitment dates back to our earliest days. St. Francis College welcomed Franco-Americans at a time when these immigrants were often excluded from college classrooms, and in fact, from even high school classrooms. During the 1960s, it hosted a series of symposia on racial equality, sponsoring events like the one that brought Dr. King to campus. Meanwhile, Westbrook College, our precursor institution in Portland, was founded as a co-educational seminary at a time when very few colleges admitted women, back in 1831. Through the years, these institutions served as powerful advocates for inclusivity, equality, and justice. Then eventually, UNE and Westbrook merged to create the university that we know today. We're proud to carry forward these fundamental values of our forebearer institutions. We live in a diverse society, and we want our community to reflect that richness of that diversity. But sadly, there remains much work ahead of us to fully achieve Dr. King's vision. Racism and discrimination still show up far too often. And even when current, even when current discriminatory practices are no longer operative, the lingering consequences of past racist practices continue to stain our society. So while we celebrate the tremendous advances toward, towards racial justice since Dr. King's remarkable life, we must avoid complacency. We must not let down our guard. At UNE, our commitment to these values remains steadfast. Our admissions team works tirelessly to ensure our student recruitment efforts reach the broadest possible demographic of students. And in recent years, 
we've attracted incoming classes of increasingly diverse students. In fact, this past fall's incoming class was one of the most diverse, ethnically, racially, socioeconomically, and geographically in UNE's history. We work equally hard to ensure our campus climate is welcoming and supportive of all students and indeed of all community members. These commitments are codified in our strategic plan, which makes a welcoming, inclusive, and vibrant community one of UNE's key strategic priorities. I hope that today's event will leave you inspired and empowered to do your part to create the more just society that Dr. King envisioned. It's still a tall hill to climb, but inspired by the wisdom of Dr. King and the righteousness of the cause lighting our way, it is surmountable. It's my pleasure now to introduce UNI's Director of Intercultural Student Engagement, my colleague and friend, Andrea Paredes. So thanks to Andrea's hard work, we've been able to put together today's event. Please enjoy, join me in welcoming Andrea. My name is Andrea Paredes, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Director of Intercultural Student Engagement. First off, thank you for joining us today, whether it be on our physical campuses in Biddeford, Portland, or Tangier, or virtually on Facebook Live. Before we begin today's panel, I would like to welcome to the stage the Associate Provost for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Shannon Slakowski. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Andrea. Hello to everybody here in Portland and Tangier. Uh, I'm honored to share a few short remarks. I know that we want to hear from our panelists very soon. First, I want to acknowledge um, and take a moment that we've had a difficult week in our country uh, with two mass shootings that targeted Asian communities, another shooting that targeted a school. So many beautiful lives were lost, and today I acknowledge the tragedy of those shootings while also honoring the goodness and light of the people who died. While they are not on this earth anymore, memories of the people who died live on with their loved ones and communities. And to anyone in our community who has been impacted by these tra tragedies, please know that I'm also holding you very close. So next, as we gather today to honor the legacy of Dr. King, I hope we'll hold close Dr. King's message of love and justice and the importance of each person doing their part to name injustice whether we are the target of that injustice or not, and to be involved in peaceful but bold solutions. As President Herbert just um, mentioned, Dr. King made a historic visit um, here to this campus. I'm new to UNE, and so I didn't know of that history, and so I spent some time um, learning about it. And if you are not familiar with the details, it's pretty extraordinary um, <clears throat> how it all happened. Um, one of my, I mean, there's so many beautiful parts of it, but one of my favorite parts is that um, the folks who were planning it basically cold called Dr. King. <laughs> uh, they looked up his phone number back when there were like house phones. Uh, and uh, that's how it all happened. So um, if you haven't read the history, I uh, highly recommend it. I just did a Google search or a search on the UNE website for Dr. King's visit to St. Francis College. Uh, it's absolutely worth the read. So as we engage in UNE's annual MLK celebration this week and next, I urge each of us to remember that Dr. King's visit to St. Francis College tethers us to our history as an institution that engages in difficult conversations, self-reflection, all in the pursuit of a more just world. The organizers of Dr. King's historic 1964 visit to St. Francis College said the intention of the on-campus symposium was, and I quote, to clarify issues in the minds of our students and parents, faculty, and total constituency by exposing them to public discussions, to organize the discussions on an intellectual plane by bringing together those minds that have toiled with the issues, whether in religious, political, literary, or sociological circles to take a firm stand in favor of justice and Christian love toward anyone, everyone. And while present-day UNE has a more secular approach to education, we are certainly still working toward having difficult conversations, reflecting deeply and personally, and creating a more just world. 
During Dr. King's address to the community of St. Francis College, he shared many profound remarks, but I want to highlight one particular thread that participants recalled from his speech. He urged the St. Francis community to truly ponder the importance of treating each person with the utmost dignity, as dignity <clears throat> is inextricably tied to justice. So today I urge us to think about dignity and justice here at UNE as we identify ways we can make a difference at UNE and beyond. As the panelists today share ways we can make a difference in our communities, I invite us to ask ourselves, what do you need in order to feel a sense of dign dignity and justice here at UNE and beyond? What can you be doing differently or more of to be in service of other people's dignity and justice for all? Thanks for being here today and for keeping Dr. King's legacy alive. Thank you for those words. In honor of Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy, we hold space today with an esteemed panel of guests, all of whom have impacted their community in some way. Our hope is that you leave feeling inspired to choose to make a difference because every day you have the choice. I would like to now introduce our panelists in order of the program you received at the door. We ask that you please hold your applause until the end of introductions. Victoria Pelletier, right on my left, is a community organizer and Portland City Councilor specializing in racial equity and community engagement. As a second black woman elected to the Portland City Council, Victoria centers her work on intersectionality, advocacy, and black liberation. She has organized and hosted a wide variety of local events on political advocacy, equity, and inclusion, and leads with unapologetic tough love in the hopes she can encourage as many people as possible to get involved. Currently, Victoria works at Portland Empowered in community facilitation, specializing in discussions on equitable policy change to ensure student and parent voices from racial and ethnic backgrounds are reflected in the procedures of Portland Public Schools. Prior to this, Victoria worked in a local government nonprofit collaborating with over 30 main cities and towns to advance racial equity and economic development in their municipalities. Sid Avidia is a trans multiracial Chicanx organizer who grew up in Los Angeles, straddling working class and middle class spaces. In 2014, they found themselves in Maine to study sociology at Bowdoin College, where they organized with campus housekeepers to win a living wage. They're now the political education director for the Southern Maine Workers Center, which fights to improve the lives and working conditions of poor and working class Mainers through organizing, advocacy, and other creative tactics like Zion parties and dinosaur cosplay. As a Portland tenant, Sid co-founded Maine People's Housing Coalition and Maine Renters United to create mutual aid networks and build tenant power. In 2022, they also worked as an educator and helped start a union at Speak About It, a theater-based consent education company. When Sid isn't organizing, they're probably roller skating, reading, or resting. Next we have Isabella Petroni, who at the age of 20 became the youngest woman ever elected citywide in Framingham, Massachusetts the first openly queer woman elected citywide and the youngest person currently elected in the city when she became a Framingham Public Library trustee. As a trustee, Isabella serves on committees focused on library programming, particularly those aimed at increasing young adults' presence at the library and at making the library a more inclusive place for all. Isabella's journey into public service started at a young age. At 17, she researched and wrote legislation to create a Framingham Youth Council, which was structured to give each district a voice to prevent, an, to prevent over representation of kids from the more affluent and non-diverse districts. The Framingham City Council enacted her legislation, which became the first citizen ordinance passed by the city of Framingham. The 13 member youth council of which Isabella became the chair as a high school senior became one of the most diverse boards in the city with a majority of women and a majority of people of color represented. Lastly, Tara Balch is the communications director at Maine Needs. She began volunteering there in early 2021 and upon finishing her degree in social and behavioral sciences at USM last spring, transitioned into her current role. She enjoys documentaries, podcasts, and our two sweet pups, Bowie and Miko. Now please give a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you. 
Thank you for that. So let's begin with what drew you into community organizing in the first place. Tara, if you would like to start, I would love to hear about your journey. Sure, so um, as you just said in the intro, I started volunteering at Maine Needs two years ago. Um, it was kind of, my work was on pause um, due to COVID and I needed something purposeful to do with my time and um, showed up on a Monday. And it was just really um, immediately apparent that when a community comes together and rallies around each other that um, a lot can happen. And so I never stopped going back. I went every single Monday since then, and now it's my job. Um, so yeah, I just think that it felt really important to put my energy into um, making an impact in the community that I'm a part of, because um, you know things can feel really heavy in the world, and we have a lot of information at our fingertips all the time, <laughs> and um, we're receiving a lot of a lot of bad news. Um, so I just wanted to try and affect the community that I'm in in a positive way. Let's go down the line. So I got into it mostly thanks to my mother, uh, who's been a lifelong journalist for about five decades now. Uh, she would bring me when I was young um, to political events and meetings, usually after school, because uh, my father was working. So I would usually get dragged there. Um, and I would just meet all these people who either were elected or were involved in volunteer work. And I just got enamored by the idea of people who dedicate their lives to public service, whose goal in life was not to make the most money, but to give back to the people who gave back to them. And really, as I just got older, I realized that I wanted to be one of those people that, unlike my mom, who was more behind the scenes, I wanted to be more at the forefront, uh, which eventually got me into it. Um, I just wanted to give back to my community that gave back so much to me. And I feel like that's some of the most important things to do. Hi. Um, so I was growing up in Los Angeles and my parents were separated and I was going back and forth between a white middle class space and a brown immigrant working class space. And I was like, why is it so different? <laughs> so I got really, you know, I had a lot of like angst and anger that was kind of like unexplored. Um, and um, for me, studying and like reading and hearing other people who were analyzing the world through a sociology framework was really validating. And I was like, oh, like, that's it. Um, and through that, I um, just kept exploring more. And the the way that I specifically got into organizing spaces was um, I had a really powerful community mental health um, experience where like I was struggling with a mental health thing and I like ended up in this like AA style support group um, where people were just like sitting in a circle validating each other's experiences. And like that's kind of how an organizing meeting feels to me too. And it was through that and exploring like the root causes of mental and physical wellness um, things that me and other people I loved were experiencing that I ended up gravitating towards this thing of like going to an endless amount of long community meetings. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that I was drawn actually to community organizing as much as community organizing just came and got me. I wanted to be, and I still want to be a florist. I actually don't really know what I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think growing up as a, as a black person in this country, as a black woman in this country, and then seeing continuous violence um, against black individuals, most often at the hands of police officers or white vigilantes, just draws you into becoming a community organizer and an activist, especially I think in a state like Maine. And so I just started speaking out um, on all of the things that I was seeing. And I just started organizing within my own community, within my friend groups, within my workspaces. Um, and I think by doing that, I just kind of continued to build into being a community organizer and activist. But again, it's not something that I sought out. Um, I just am suddenly here. So, yeah. <laughs> Can I be your first uh, flower arrangement? I have fingers crossed. Please. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> as far as your personal philosophy of change, what does that look like for y'all? And what motivates you to continue doing this work? Um, Tori, let's start with you. Um, I mean, I'm motivated by a lot of organizers that are continuously working to to advocate for change because I think this realm of being a community organizer is a really thankless job. It's not a paid job. It's just really working with passion. And so I'm inspired by organizations that are led um, 
predominantly by people of color that are led at the grassroots level and the local level and the level with not a lot of funding. And I think that's the group that I am in and I'm trying to always amplify. So that that in itself uh, inspires me. And then is it in terms of tracking change? How do I see change? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess I determine change based on where we are now versus where we are like 10 or 12 years ago, I think when I really started organizing in the first space. I mean, I think we have a lot of younger people now that are getting really involved. I go see schools a lot in middle schools. They're completely involved in what's happening locally and what's happening across the country, which is really inspiring. When I was 12, I was not as engaged as the 12 year olds are today. So I feel like seeing things like that makes me feel like there is change that's coming and happening and also just our general access to social media. Um, so it's happening. It's happening really slowly, but I do see uh, people getting younger and younger and, and caring a lot about what's happening socially and getting involved politically. Um, so I want to talk about this like buzzword phrase that we call at the Worker Center where I work transformative organizing. And that's kind of our philosophy of change. And to me, what that means is it's not so much about like, did we pass the bill or did we get 50 people to come out to an event? But it's like, did I make a connection with somebody who, whether we have the same experience or a different one, we really connected and see the same root causes of the things that we're struggling with. And then we feel stronger to go back out together and figure out what the solutions to our problems are. Um, so it's very like relational. It's very much about like being in solidarity with people that have my experience and people that don't and learning from that. Um, and I think I think that's that's why I am willing to like work at the worker center. I kind of like had sworn off working at nonprofits for a while um, and decided to come back because um, it the the relational approach. It's really about like one on one connections and like um, there's a quote um, that's by Grace Lee Boggs that's like critical connections are more important than critical mass. Um, and that's really my philosophy was like what do we need to do to sustain ourselves to create the long term systems change that we need. Um, the other part of that for me is um, political education. So my like job title is political education director, which is mostly like a fancy thing. So certain people take me seriously. I'm really like more proud to call myself an organizer. But what political education means to me is um, it's about, again, like coming together and being like, I'm experiencing this with my housing. You're experiencing that. I'm in Portland. You're in Boulder. You're in LA. Like, what are the common threads um, in a way that's actually like a little bit anti-academic and like anti-elitist so that like my experience as like a, tra a trans brown person from my words is more valuable than what somebody else like looking at data about people like me would say, um, because we actually know our experience is the best. Um, and I think we really need to fight back against like this sort of top down, like pe only people in the legislature who have policy degrees after their names know what's going on, because we really know what's going on. Um, and when we're just like talking shit with our coworkers at our jobs, like that is political information. And that is like the best type of political information to me. Um, so my like philosophy of change is a lot about supporting that and creating space for that. Um, and yeah, and then the last thing I'll say about that that I love to plug is one of my favorite organizers that I follow and learn a lot from um, Dean Spade talks a lot about how and like he's a lawyer, he has a law degree, but he talks a lot about how like we are really trained in this country specifically to think that if you are a young person and you want to go out and change the world and make things better for your family or your community you need to change the law or you need to become a lawyer and he like spends a lot of time convincing people not to become lawyers and like there's a lot of really helpful lawyers like that i work with but um what we really need more of is like this awareness that what the law says is just like a story that the government is telling about itself and like what is happening to us on the ground is really different a lot of the time than what the law says is happening um so I think like I love that this panel is about organizing um, and not about policy change because I think like whether you're trying to get policy change or you're trying to get like more tenant control in your relationship with your landlord like the organizing is really the backbone of all of that um, but it's not as institutionally supported there's not like oh I'm gonna go through this program and get a scholarship to learn organizing and that's not a coincidence it's because the people who are like in charge of the country don't want people to learn those skills um, so I really like love plugging like it's it's a little more vague and like less obvious of like how to start, but it's actually like happening all around us. And um, yeah, looking for organizing opportunities just like where you already are is a lot of fun and powerful. 
I guess my personal philosophy comes a little bit for the background of how I created the Youth Council and goes a little bit back to my mother and my father. My father is a union member, proud union member. He's been a letter carrier for about over four decades as well. And my mother is a journalist um, and she always considers herself the fourth branch of the government and always trying to be that independent person checking. Um, so my philosophy comes a lot from them. But my also philosophy meaning is just telling people is sometimes just doing it, just trying it out, um, is a way to make change because people don't expect it. They expect you just to kind of complain online. We were talking about this a bit earlier. Um, you know, I see a lot of people around who are just complaining and I'm like, I don't see you at community meetings. I don't see you at organizers. I don't see you at fundraisers. I don't see you at city council meetings. Like, if this is stuff apparently you're passionate about, then why do I see you on Facebook 24 seven? Why do I see you on Instagram and Twitter 24 seven? I don't see you on the ground. Do you care as much about it? Um, and that's kind of how the Youth Council kind of got started. I wrote an essay when Framingham became a city. It was a town for about 370 years, but now we're about 80,000 people and towns do not work at that size. So we transitioned. Um, and one of the things I wanted was a youth council. We had a council on aging, we still do, but we didn't have anything for young people. And as Victoria put out, um, a lot of more young people are getting involved in environmental work and mental health in school shootings, like we're seeing it. Um, but there was no really space to do it. So I'm like, well, I was just annoyed because I'm like, I told these people that I wanted to do it and I, like they're not listening. Of course they're not listening. I'm 16, I'm 17. Why would they care what I think? And mom's like, well, if you want something done, you gotta do it yourself. So I'm like, all right then. So literally just searched online, found other pieces of ordinances and wrote it up myself as a high school senior. Cause I'm like, if they're not gonna do it, I gotta do it myself. Even though there's not as much steps tutorial, it's really me trying to figure out this complicated legalese and try to figure it out because there's no one else is gonna make that space and now, the other thing about it was, is like when I created it, I'm like, I want to have a district by district because district by district is one of the most important victories we got with the city because beforehand, all of the representation was north of Route 9. All of the school's members were north of Route 9 when the majority of kids were south of Route 9. The majority of the people who needed representation didn't have any. And I'm like, I know how this works. I know how appointment processes work. It's always going to be the affluent kids. And I'm like, that just doesn't represent Framingham. We're a city of 80,000 and we pride ourselves on our immigration and diversity. But if we don't reflect it, then what's the point of it? So I literally coded in because I'm like, if this is not going to get coded in, this will always get ignored. And they're like, People in the past are like people like them aren't going to apply. People south of Route 9, people south of 135, people like me who people don't assume because they're like, oh, you look like that. You people aren't interested in politics. You people aren't interested in that. Um, and as I said before, we got a very diverse board just out of people who are interested who are like, hey, here's a space, here's an opportunity. And it just came naturally, which is like, here's the school's district, who's interested? And you just naturally got this diverse group that really represented the city more than any boards, committees, and commissions that came beforehand. And that's all just by doing something and allowing people to have the space and deciding that you're the one who has to make the space. You're the one who has to go for someone, even if it seems daunting, even if you're only high school and there's a bunch of like 11 adults who are standing before you. It's just the idea of like, you have to make space for yourself as a young person, um, as a person who you are, because no one else sometimes is gonna make the space for you. And just doing it, you make change you wouldn't have imagined. Yeah, so um, I think that in general, change is just like, you know, inherent to the human condition. It's happening to all of us all of the time. So like we might as well have a say in how it happens. Um, so I think that's a big part of what motivates me, but also I'm super motivated by knowing that there's a lot that I don't know um, and there's a lot that all of us don't know. And I think that we can all benefit from knowing a lot more. Um, I think it's fascinating to be on a learning journey forever, but I also think it's really um, a catalyst for change. Um, and so I'm the communications director for a nonprofit, so I do our social media. And um, anytime I post about any kind of social issue on our platform, inevitably people say, I didn't know that that was happening. Um, and I don't think that we can expect people to work towards changing something that they don't know is flawed or broken. Um, so yeah, I think that just getting, taking in as much information as you can and kind of disseminating it back out to your community is uh, what's gonna keep us all on the, on the right path together. 
That's a perfect segue into our next question. If I can shamelessly plug at main needs on Instagram, I will. Uh, they get so much information out. If you could post on your story, uh, it is really just a wonderful organization. Um, but Tara, what advice do you have for someone who wants to get involved in community activism but doesn't know how? That is a really good transition because I think social media. Um, my nonprofit actually got started as a Facebook group and just gained a lot of traction and we grew from there. Um, but the social media is super powerful. It can be a total bummer, but it can also be like a really powerful tool for community. Um, so I think follow your local community organizers, follow your local activism groups. Um, you know, see what resonates with you. They'll tell you what they need on their page, um, share their posts. I guarantee they always want more people involved. So I think social media is a really good place to start. Yeah, I have to kind of go off of that. I just finding who wants to be involved, finding out opportunities to get involved and just deciding to do it. Sometimes I think we got this hesitation that you're not good enough, um, that you aren't qualified enough, that you're things are enough. But I think I think this has been a better transition that it's not just the policies and it's not just the degrees. It's the experience. Experience is just as much of a valid thing. So if you have a lived experience um, in any neighborhood or you're passionate about it, like get involved in it. Um, it can feel like a leap into a thousand steps, but I don't think like I've seen the people that I've mentored as part of the youth council who just took a chance, who had never done this before, who were as young as people who were in middle school, as young as 13 years old, um, who had never done this before. Um, and they now have this opportunity because they took this chance that they got to meet other kids like them, meet other people who are as passionate about them. Um, and it's always astounding because some of them who were 13 or 14, I'm like, you're knowing more about what the city is, what's going on about like the water bill crisis than people double or triple your age and it's astonishing. Um, so just getting involved, especially coming from a young perspective, um, you'll find usually at least sometimes one person to mentor you, or even if it's not like finding a support network behind you. Um, because I think we just sometimes underestimate ourselves and tell ourselves we're not good enough. I don't think, I had to get pushed kind of into applying for a library trustee and to running for office because I thought to myself, I'm only 20, I'm in college, what do I know? But then I'm like, the library, it's such an integral part of me. I've been going since I was four or five. I'm a young person. The board, as much as I love them, are like average age 60, 65, and the library has changed at this point. Most of the librarians are around my age. There's a lot of a generational thing. Um, now I feel like I have a position of partially being ambassador between the younger administration, younger librarians, and the older staff of like, things are changing. But I wouldn't have done that if I didn't have one, people to support around me, but two, to take the leap of going, well, if I run for office and I lose the first time, then at least I had the experience, but now I'm in it. And I just need kind of a bit of a push. And sometimes you just need that. You need to tell yourself that you're better than you think we are, because I think we all doubt ourselves and tell ourselves we're not enough. Um, so if you are a worker, which doesn't just mean you having a job, but is also you going to school or caring for your family members or like being the person in your household who does a lot of unrecognized work, um, the Worker Center is a great way to I work again um, and we are basically a collective of angry workers um, and um, yeah we talk about like why are our working conditions like this why is all the household labor that we do underpaid and unpaid um, and we've had like I think since I've been involved at least a dozen folks who've joined the worker center and then been able to actually do something to change their working conditions whether that means unionizing I think the Biddeford Starbucks just unionized nearby that's awesome um, but not just unionizing, also just like working with your coworkers to um, organize for higher pay with your boss. Like there's so many different ways to change working conditions and we love to get creative about that. Um, and if you are interested in like doing something with the anger that I'm sure everybody in this crowd has had at your job, please um, check out our website and, and we'll invite you to a meeting. Um, the, but also on the other hand, um, I feel like it's a myth that you have to like go out and join an organization to organize. You don't like you don't have to get with a nonprofit. You don't even have to like go to city council, although sometimes you should. Um, I think it's like um, the places where we go every single day, like our jobs or our apartments um, and dealing with our bosses and our landlords is like the I think some of the most powerful under recognizes under recognized places that people have been making change. Um, 
so like yesterday my landlord like got into a fight with my roommate over text about the snowplow and then like we talked to all four of the other people who live in our building and like we all texted him and like that's like mini organizing and like we got what we needed with the plow um so stuff like that really is like the skills that you will need and that you will be able to use all through your life like you don't need to work at a nonprofit. and i like a lot of me is like i don't recommend working at a nonprofit. it really depends like i encourage you to be suspicious of like a lot of nonprofit jobs because they're not always what they seem um but um but yeah there's really like so much opportunity just in the spaces that you're going all through your life um including like this school including your jobs your apartments wherever um and i feel like there was something else i was gonna say and i forgot it um oh yeah i think um like follow where you're this is like more of an emotional sort of like like thread but like follow like where your anger and your grief take you and like see where that is um like there's no there's no like set like array of issues that is important or that is like something that will matter and like if you're feeling something like chances are the people around you are feeling it too so like talking about it with those people and like being a little vulnerable with people that it's safe to be vulnerable with and being like why are things like this like that is the start to everything um and it's really hard to stay hopeful um and i think that noticing what makes you feel hopeful and doing that over and over and experimenting and be like oh that didn't make me feel hopeful but that's okay i'll just try something else like really with like an iterative experimental lens is really important for like sustainability if you're trying to get involved um because you also don't need to be an extrovert or a public speaker or someone who's comfortable talking to strangers like there's so many roles to play in social movements um and in making change um so like having that lens of like humility and being willing to try a bunch of stuff until you find something that like creates enough hope to keep you going to the next thing i think is really useful I don't even know where to begin because I want to give you so much advice and I don't want to, I'm, I can't talk for the next like four hours and be like, okay, here's all my advice on organizing. Um, and I also had a really, I've, I've just, I'm in my second year now on the city council and I ha I've had a very trying January. So I'm also like, all right, which, which direction am I going in today? Like, what's my mood on like giving you advice? But I think about, um, in terms of community organizing, I think it's really important for you to have um, energy to do this work because this work is really not for everybody and it is there's no end in sight. So it's not like a project that you pick up and then after six months you are now like, OK, I, I like did a thing. It's really lifelong work. And I think you you either have the the energy for it or you, or you don't. Again, I wanted to be a florist. I don't really know why I'm here, but I'm here and I'm being drawn into it constantly. I don't think I'll ever be able to get away from it because there's so much to do. But I I also think it's really important, like others have said, to make sure that you're building community really intentionally. Social media is a great place to start. I utilize social media to the highest degree, but I also think it's really important to take your work to the streets and build community with individuals who aren't on social media and who aren't in the know of what's going on on Facebook or Instagram and who aren't who don't have English as their first language and who aren't born in America so that we can make sure that we are building intersectional community. I think that that's really important. Um, and I think you'll get a lot farther with that. And I, I, I also think too, we're, we're kind of stuck in this thing where we, we determine success by our levels of social media engagement. And so I also have people say like, you know, I've, I've been told by people who want to organize, like I tried to do this thing and only 15 people came. And 15 people is a lot of people to come to something that hasn't existed before. But because of social media, if it's not like 5.2 million people, everybody thinks it's a failure. So I think even if your numbers are starting small, but you want to create something or you want to do something, if five people show up, that's a really big deal. That's five people that are like, yeah, no, I, I'm, I agree with what you're saying and I want to do more and you can build from there. So you know, don't get discouraged and think that you have to have all of the answers and all of the, all of the pull. Um, immediately. And then I think like my two quick pieces of advice on like starting community organizing or building something. My first thing is for anything that you want to build, make sure that there's not a black woman already doing it. 
And then my second piece of advice is you have to have a sense of humor um, to, to do this work because there are, there are going to be some days that you don't want to do it anymore. Um, and you have to be able to find your moments of joy. You have to be able to find your moments of mental health. Um, and I, you know, I think if you are, if you are really ready to get involved, of course, like this is a long answer. So I'm happy to talk to any of you after if you, if you were really like, I want to get into it to this, but it's lifelong work and there's, there's no end. So as long as you have that, that sustained energy and you know that in little pieces, you're going to be doing this for the rest of your life. Um, you know, that's a, that's a good starting point. Have you experienced burnout or compassion fatigue? I What's burnout. <laughs> burnout. I'm fine. <laughs> I feel like my therapist is watching this and she's like, she's she's not fine. Um burnout is burnout and I are very close. We're good friends because we like do this game of being like, oh, I'm not tired, are you? No, I'm not. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. Um, but I I do think I I'm I'm being more aware of my mental health. I think especially on being on city council in Portland um, is a trip and it is very, <laughs> that's the word I'm picking today, it's a trip. It is, it's 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 a lot all the time, especially being one of the youngest members. I am, I was the second black woman ever elected. There is now another black woman, which is great. It's not just me, but it it's a lot of, it's a lot of work and it takes a lot out of you. And then on top of that, just general organizing, um, it's tough. And so burnout is real and the challenges of mental health with this work are also real. And I wish I had a, a great answer on like, you know, here's what I'm doing to combat burnout, but like to be, keep it all the way real with you. I, I don't really know. I don't have a lot of, I don't, I, I haven't made it there yet in terms of saying like, this is something I can walk away from. And I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm certainly trying to be more mindful of where I'm putting my time and where I'm putting my energy and like when to put my phone down, when to not go on Instagram, do not read the comment section of the Portland Press Herald, you know how it goes. But it it is, it's really tough and it's challenging. And I think that that's a big part of this work too, is you are going to get burned out just by, um, as I think as Tara mentioned, like the, there's just a lot of news. There's a lot of stuff on social media that can really bum you out. People on social media have access to you. People are keyboard warriors and they will send you the most heinous stuff you've ever read. So I, I, I think I'm trying to figure out where my limit is in terms of how much I can absorb. And I think too, as a black woman, there's also this level of people always looking for you to have the answers and looking for you to lead the charge on change. So I'm trying to uh, pull other people into the conversation. And I think a big thing I campaigned on was community leadership. So like, yes, I'm the district two counselor. I have the mouthpiece, but we are all doing this. So like, if you're DMing me on something, I like, I want to hear what you're doing too. And I want to hear what, what initiate, what, what things that you're trying to initiate and whether or not you're coming to meetings and what you think about these things so that we can all do this together. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Burnout is real. And my, my, I'm trying to be mindful of my mental health and, I mean, I have a black therapist, so there's that. So that's that's about where I am now. Um, yeah, it's super hard. <laughs> um, I fool myself all the time into thinking that I'm not burnt out, and I usually probably am. And like, that's just a recent realization that I've been having with like, you know, year three of the pandemic, and like, most of the people that I love are not okay, and that sucks. Um, so I think finding time to grieve that, like, like personally i've never been to so many like funerals and memorials than i have been to in the past three years and like that hits really hard when i think about it and um i think having space to grieve in community and with people that i trust has been really important and healthy for me and a lot of the days i like don't want to do it i'm like no thank you i like, don't want to touch that today um so it's like a weird awkward dance um but i think um something that my therapist said that I try to think about is when I'm feeling um, compassion fatigue and when I'm feeling like a little numb to the pain of the people around me, that is a sign that I actually need to deepen my own well of compassion for myself um, and like recharge myself and like have a little grace to be like, okay, Sid, like you are feeling numb to your friend who's texting you asking for a ride. Why is that? It's probably because you need to like take a bath and like eat today. Um, and 
And like what motivates me to do that when I don't want to or when I feel like I don't deserve that is um, I have this commitment to like create the conditions for myself that I would want to give to my friends or my coworkers or like someone coming in the next generation um, because and I can I can say this like really strongly from working at a worker center and having a window into lots of different workplace dynamics. Um, the way that we treat ourselves and the standards that we put to ourselves really deeply impacts the people around us. So if I'm like in a leadership role in an organization and I'm like on grind culture and I'm like, I'm going to do this and that and this and I'm going to always be the one who initiates the meeting and I'm going to send the follow up notes and I'm going to be the one to call everybody and remind them. Everybody around me is looking at that and seeing that as a model. Um, so that's like often what stops me is like, oh, like what I want my coworker Stacy to have to do this and like feel like a failure if she doesn't like, no, I would not. <laughs> um, so that's like what helps me when I'm not able to like start with compassion for myself is thinking about other people because the way that we work together, which is really important when we're thinking like generations into the future, how are we going to govern ourselves if we're not happy with how we're being governed now? Like we need to have those skills of like doing really specific detailed tiring logistical work together um so like having those skills to do that in a way that's sustainable is super important um yeah and like it's also really important to have fun and get to know the people that we're trying to make change with and like find moments of laughter and like yeah like having a sense of humor i find really like keeps me going through a lot of things that piss me off on a day-to-day -day level um so yeah <laughs> Yeah, also talking about compassion burnout and compassion fatigue, uh, the beginning of the pandemic was, and good old social media, it's back again. Um, I was, you know, you want to have compassion for others and you want to take the well, but sometimes you learn it's too much. Um, and I was definitely feeling that in 2020 because I'm like, if I'm not paying attention to what's going on in the climate, if I'm not paying attention to what's going into political climate, then I'm a bad person and I'm not doing my part and I'm just being as ignorant as the people I'm complaining about. Um, and I got into a really, really bad depression in the last part of 2020 and it impacted my grades. I'm still currently in school, so there's also that kind of thing. And I realized to myself, and I'm going to partially pull from a book that we um, spoke a lot to what I eventually learned for myself, um, which is a book about climate anxiety, um, which also has a lot to do, given that I'm also looking, going to the environmental, and there's a lot of mental health thing, and it's glad that there's now stuff going on and more focus being put on mental health related to climate issues, because there's a lot to do with it. Um, but one of the book talks about, like, if you're not giving compassion to yourself, then you're not able to help the people that you are wanting to help at all. Um, you're not giving them your full attention because you're not giving your full attention. Um, so sometimes you just have to take a step back um, and kind of learn to a bit compartmentalize as much as you kind of hate it because if you're getting so overwhelmed by everything that's bad going on in the world, then you're not able to help other people. And then kind of the point of what's the point of I wouldn't say what's the point of you, but it's kind of the thing I told myself. I'm like, what's the point if I'm not able to give back to myself and self-care? Because we're told that self-care is kind of selfishness. And then we realize it's not selfishness because we want to live as we're trying to give others. And if we can't do that, then we're not really a thing. So I'm obviously it's an end, end struggle. There will be times I see something and I'm like, yep, my anxiety and my depression has gone up for the day. I'm like, time to go to the comfort media, which is really what got me out of it. And partially of that is like learning to let yourself be less serious. Because a lot of the comfort media I was doing during the time during the pandemic that I needed was stuff I remember from my childhood. And learning like we tell ourselves that, oh, we've grown up, we've grown older, we don't need to go back to that stuff. And then you realize like this is the stuff that helped me. And if anyone else attacks me on this ever again, I'm going to punch someone at this point because we we have our pieces of comfort media and we're kind of told like grow up go on and I'm like the things that make you happy no matter what they are if they're not hurting others like allow yourself to be happy with them because in this world in with everything you're doing especially if you're in organizing like you need it as much as possible um, and I think that's the thing we have to learn about you know growing older and what does that mean growing older as well as learning to be wiser yeah, I think you all covered it. So I'm going to be real quick. Um, one, I just discovered do not disturb mode on my phone. It's incredible. Um, and that actually really helps kind of free myself from the delusion that I'm that important. Um, if I need to check out for four hours, the world is not going to burn down. So <laughs> that is a really important reminder, I think, that we can all take the time when we need the time. 
So, first of all, my thing is Scooby Doo. Uh, I'm a 25 years old. There was a video that someone put out. Um, um, it was by Nerd Sync um, that they put out because they had a massive depressive episode and really. To- um, creatives and they were watching episodes of a pup named Scooby Doo a lot, um, and they were talking about because they're like that covers the anxiety because it's like you know the repetitive formula that's coming. Like people complain about, it, I'm like I need the repetitive formula now, and they, it was helping them be able to adjust through their anxiety and like months long depression they were going through through the creative. And you were saying that I'm like oh my god I remember that because I remember watching that video for myself and it was like. I'm okay to like comfort media. I'm allowed to like things that people deem that I'm not supposed to like, whether because of my gender or because of my age, because, you know, you know, the society is already telling me that is the thing that's giving me the stress. So I'm like, why would I partially listen to them, find the things that make me happy and enjoyable? So funny you mentioned that. Uh, I want to open up the space for y'all to brag a bit. I just kind of dampen the mood a little bit, asking about compassion fatigue and burnout. I'm sure most people in here can also uh go along with that sentiment but i want to give y'all the space to brag let's talk about what you've done what are you proud of what have you uh, accomplished in the work that you've done that you feel like it's important for other people tara i am a really bad bragger i don't really (laughs) think it's my place um i'm part of a larger organization. There are a lot of people that are involved in this effort. We call ourselves a community effort um, at Maine Needs. So it's really, it's an all hands on deck operation. And I'm just kind of the one that got handed the wheel. Um, So I don't know. I just, what what makes me proudest is um, when we can really get information out and get people engaged in being involved in their community, whether that's, you know, contacting their representatives or having difficult conversations with people in their lives. I think that that's the stuff that really uh, sets me on fire. So that will be my answer for now. (laughs) So I guess I'll talk about something from the Youth Council and then a little bit into stuff because it's continued into the trustees. Um, So we passed ordinances even as the Youth Council, which was kind of exciting because not only was the youth council founded through ordinances that were passed by young people who technically at the time i passed it i wasn't even allowed to vote but we passed particularly one ordinance that is now continued on even through my trustee work um, about um having allowing free menstrual products to be in all city buildings um accessed restocked um and then just the idea of it that we wrote it collectively together we took it um from a base of another community that was doing it um we edited it around we also talked about a conversation about reframing the language because originally the ordinance that we took inspiration from was feminine and we're like no we're not going to do that we're going to be inclusive to people who identify as non-binary and trans and we're not going to not do that because i felt uncomfortable of it in the first place so it was the idea of doing and there was members of the um the council who were uncomfortable with it so we're like not only can we change it so that this ordinance is different than the one that came before it but we can also change it so that the conversation is different so that the people who are passing it know this stuff now because some of the people who are going to go through this legislation doesn't so now it was passed and even in the trustees, we're still working on it. And I've been working with um, one of the trustees um, who's an older woman. Um, and we've been having some meaningful conversations. She's in her 60s and 70s, but she's absolutely lovely. Um, and it's also just having those conversations about the language change. And after I told her, it was even though, you know, we told old people can't change as much, which is still partially true. It still feels like a push and a nudge. Um, she started you know changing her own language and changing her husband's language and it was just incredible to witness because it was like you know it was almost like thank god this proves that myth one time wrong uh, but it's just kind of an incredible experience because it allows people to have themselves to feel welcome and create a collaborative effort because it was all of us as the youth council who was working to propose it because it has to be passed by all of us like the committees work on it um, but then we all have to pass it. We all put our input in it. And even now, like it still has become a collaborative effort in the library. Um, and we've also been working on, in addition to the idea of putting it, but also in a sense, also creating more gender neutral spaces and more inclusive spaces in the library. So 
it's also interesting because sometimes having that one success also broadens the horizons into multiple ways that you didn't think possible. And I think that's what's cool about its success. It's not just impacts. It's done and it's one. It's the idea of like, it's not a project. It's done and it's one. Now you've changed something about a dynamic or you've changed something about an environment that wasn't there before. And now it's fundamentally offered, altered because of one thing that a group of you all did. Um, okay, so quite a few of the political projects that I've been part of have like ended or fizzled out. Um, and I think that's actually totally fine and like not a failure. And like, I think um, I need to check myself all the time of like success and like a good thing that I can like brag about doesn't mean like something that lasts forever because our conditions are changing all the time. So like I'm proud of, you know, having been part of People's Housing Coalition when we were saying housing should be a human right in Portland and decriminalize homelessness and like 200 of us were at City Hall for like 18 days in 2020 and we really didn't get any of our demands met. Um, but like a lot of people met each other and a lot of people got inspired by like being together in that space and the, our organization isn't really doing anything public right now because we like are still processing <laughs> but like um, like the learning that we have from that, I am really proud of. And I'm proud of like the people that I'm in community with learning together. Um, at the Worker Center, we similarly are in like a weird organizational space. Um, we are in the middle of this transition going from a more traditional nonprofit that has an executive director and then staff that are hierarchically below that director to being three organizers who work together and don't have a boss. Um, it's super fun to be able to say that I don't have a boss. I love like saying that with anybody that I encounter because like everybody in this room is a worker. Like y'all probably could think of ways to replace your boss with like more like and it's not it's not like kill bosses. It's like it's like there are ways to like spread that work out so that it's like equitable and like everybody has a say in the things that are impacting you um, and you get to decide that collaboratively with your other people that you're doing your work with, which like is better than one person having the pressure on them to think that they know everything and think that they should like set everybody else's working conditions. So I'm really proud to be like modeling that and like in that messy chaotic transition myself. Um, Cause it's really nice to be able to talk to workers who come to us with issues in their own workplaces and be like, yeah, you're so right. Like you do know what's going on in your workplace better than your boss does. And like you have the right and it's actually possible to fight for that. Um, and on that note, the last other thing I'll say is um, I feel really good to be in um, international community with other organizations that are like all working together to, again, like build our collective analysis of what the heck is going on um, and like experimenting together. Um, the Worker Center is part of this um, international alliance called Grassroots Global Justice, um, which is a collection of like 70 or so um, like small grassroots organizations in US, the US and US occupied territory that are all kind of trying to like come together to fight climate change and imperialism from sort of like our weird position in the world, like within the belly of the beast as like the US being the sort of like arbiter of those things. Um, and I got to go to Oakland in October to like meet in person with a bunch of those groups. And I've like never felt so like stoked and like full of hope to like keep doing organizing because I think the other thing is like with compassion fatigue, it's like, what are we actually fighting for? And like, what do we think? And like, what do we want to happen in 10 years, 100 years? I think a lot of us, it's really easy to say I'm like anti this and anti that. And like, I'm, I'm kind of like, I get annoyed by all the messaging that's like, oh, Gen Z is like anti this, anti that. Like that's, I don't think that's true. Um, but it is harder to say what we're for and like what we want. And we need to be in community developing that analysis together. So like the main thing that this international coalition that we're in is fighting for in the next few years is divesting from harm and investing in care. And that encompasses so many different things. Um, but I feel really proud to be part of this like massive collective of people that's trying to figure out how to do that in our different locales and like different strategies and just like learning and failing and experimenting together. Um, Tara won't brag about herself, but I, I will. So Tara is great. May Needs is amazing. You all need to be engaging with May Needs. They do an incredible amount of work. They engage, they get people excited actually to get involved in what's happening at the council level, at what's happening at the state level. 
Um, and so I'm beyond thankful for you and for all of the other individuals that are involved in main needs because we don't have anything like that. We've never had anything like that. And they do really impactful work um, in Maine. I'm speaking specifically to what's happening in Portland, but it's all over Maine. So make sure that you're engaging with them. Sid also does an incredible amount of work. A lot of the organizing that happens in Portland is because of you. Southern Maine Worker Center is fantastic. Maine Renters United is fantastic. So also engage with them. Isabel, I just met you today, but you're amazing. I can't really brag about myself because I'm awkward. Like even when my bio was being read, I was just like, yeah. Yes. You know, it's me. But um, I I'm really I'm thankful to be to be in spaces, I think, where I can hear of others success, because it's really important, I think, to to be excited about the incredible things that we're doing, even though this work is really hard. So the success that I determined for myself is being the second black woman that's ever been elected to the Portland City Council. That's really important for me. And I hope that I can be a role model for younger people who are looking to get involved, who have no experience. Um, I had no political experience. I still don't really know what I'm doing over there. But it's it's one of those things, I think, where it was, if it's not going to be me, I don't know who it's going to be. Um, so I just decided to to jump in. But I did just want to plug my my bragging on on, you know, the the things that I think the three of you represent because it's really important work, so. Exactly. And that's on community, yeah. <laughs> Before we open the floor to our attendees, I wanna ask one more question. What is one thing you wish everyone did as a small form of activism? Um, I think it, let's, one, th one thing is, is, challenging but i think that it's really important to build community in spaces that um that are like everyday spaces that you go in whether that's like where you exist now in like a dorm or an apartment or a housing complex or like a kid's birthday party like i think it's really important to be having conversations with individuals and figuring out ways that you can build community with them beyond like the how's the weather conversations because every single person has something that they believe in and every single person has something that i'm sure they've experienced so i would love if people just started having more conversations with their friends, their neighbors, and their community members, and just understand what they're about and what they're hoping to to be and what they hope the city or the town or the state that they live in should be. I think that, that that's something that would be really helpful, I think, and impactful of just getting to know individuals outside of your common spaces. Um, and then the other small act, I think, is just starting to diversify the own space that you occupy and don't just leave it for MLK Day and Black History Month and Juneteenth. But it would be great if like businesses that you're shopping at that are black owned are not dedicated to uh, June, February and January. But if you just actually like made that something that you do regularly and if the the people that you support um, are, are being supported outside of the the months that I think are dedicated to specifically, I'm just talking from my personal experience of, of, of black people and of black leaders. Uh, I, I really think that, you know, if we can start making these things more commonplace, then, then we, I think, will go a lot further in terms of the relationships that we're trying to build with one another. And then my last plug, because I feel like I have to, is Get to know your counselors, start going to city council meetings. They're kind of exciting sometimes, especially in Portland. I think they're more exciting than they've ever been in Portland. Um, they are boring by design, but that's where a lot of the decisions are made. And we have the same five people showing up to every single meeting that speak out every single meeting. And I would love to see a room um, that is more reflective of, of who we serve. So whether you're in Portland or outside of Portland, get to know who's actually leading your city, get to know your counselors and your representatives and your state reps and who's making the decisions and figure out whether or not you want to make public comment at these things, whether you wanna run for these seats. We have so many seats that are uncontested, especially at the state level that are being held for decades by individuals who are just running because they have no one else to run against. I would love to see more people involved. I would love to see more younger people involved. Again. I have no experience doing city council. I don't have a poli sci degree. I study journalism. Y'all know I want to be a florist. Like I'm just involved in this world because I wanted to get involved because nobody else was going to do what I thought we should be doing. So 
that's my other thing of advice is just like figure out something that you can do to make radical change within the spaces that you occupy. I have to say, too, if you're trying to figure out how to get involved in city politics, even if you don't live in Portland, following Victoria on Instagram is the most clear and sense of humor laden way to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say something kind of similar of like the spaces that you're already in, but I'll lift up a specific part that has worked well for me, which is talk shit with your coworkers, but in an intentional way and ask two questions like, why do we think that it's like this? And how do we wish it was instead? Um, and that can take you so far. Um, I've been lucky to work in multiple part time jobs where I was with coworkers that were also down to make things happen. And I the last part time job I had, we unionized within a period of like a couple months. It was a small place, so it takes less time if there's less people. But like that was a super fun experience for me and like really empowering. Um, and um, there's obviously a wave of unionization happening in service jobs right now, which I'm really stoked about. Um, and if anyone's curious about that or if you have a service job and you're like, what's the first step, please come talk to me or reach out to the Worker Center because we would love to hook you up with the union people or just talk to you about if you want a specific change, what are some organizing tactics you could use to try to get that change. Um, and yeah, and then I think like the other reason that I, I – We'll plug specifically like talking with your coworkers and figuring out what building power in your workplace looks like is like if you care about climate, if you care about racial justice, like labor has always been a sometimes like hesitant, but like also really important part of those movements. And like if we're actually if we're actually going to make like really big moves on climate, we need labor to go along with it. So if you have a union and you're like, oh, what can we do from our union to push like our company that has a carbon footprint or our company that like has like an impact over the racial dynamics of this workplace like there's there's ways to address like almost every issue um that you could name within like social movements from a labor standpoint um and we really need more unions especially in maine i think to be more aware of that and more proactive on that so whether you're in a union or not like there's ways to address climate and racial justice and like so many things um from from a like work standpoint um, so yeah, come talk to me about organizing your workplace. I think, well, want to go off that point. It's amazing what you can do when the unions and the environmentalists are with each other. Pacific Northwest is a wonderful example with the timber members and the, the myth of it not working is bull. It's basically what the people on the top down want to tell you about it, which it's just, you can find, which I guess kind of comes into my point about piece of activism. Um, it's kind of a balance of back to the self-care, but also listening, listening in the community spaces, allowing people to feel that they have the chance for vulnerability. I think a lot of our society tells us that we're supposed to do those how are the weather questions because we're not supposed to get vulnerable. Um, and especially it's more prevalent if you're of a certain gender or race or socioeconomic status where there's even more societal pressures put on either being vulnerable or not being vulnerable. Um, and allowing the space for people to be vulnerable is not only good from an activism standpoint, because um, especially if you're coming maybe from a different socioeconomic status or background, it really allows you to actually fully listen and make it so it's not just one, the top down, but also that it's fully a working together of a cross intergenerational and a cross um, class work, which is way more powerful and transformative than just people alone. Um, but it's also just the idea of allowing people to be comfortable in the spaces. Um, and I think that's just good from a person, like we're, we're pu human, we're people, we like interacting with species, we're an interactive species. Um, and you can, the last three years have kind of demonstrated what happens to our mental health when we don't get the chance to do that. Even if we, even if you're an introvert and you told yourself that you were going to be fine during the pandemic, as someone who is also a fellow introvert who has public speaking issues, I was not fine after the pandemic. We need people. And I think part of the reason why that it's sometimes so hard is that we have to have these very shallow conversations. So if we allow ourselves to listen um, from both an activist standpoint, as well as a people standpoint, I feel that we get that compassion, that empathy, that cross understanding way more than we would have. And not only do we build good working relationships to be able to fight the problems that we're working on, but we can also just build good friendships that we can rely on to go, hey, I'm not feeling good at the moment. Can you pick up something like that's something I've learned. I'm currently the president of Alliance, which Andrea is kind of the unofficial um, kind of 
club advisor for. And sometimes for us, it's not just having a set meeting schedule and learning just to have a space for people to talk for an hour. And when I was having issues with the foot that you demonstrate, I had club members who were like, do you need anything? Do you have anything? And I'm like, I didn't think I was going to be able to foster that kind of space beforehand. But now I have people that I can rely on. They rely on me. And it's a wave stronger over time. And all you can just do is listen and allow space to build so that people can feel intimate and vulnerable because I think our culture tells us we're not supposed to. And doing that basically counteracts that and what's a better way of being a rebel than being intimate and vulnerable with each other. Okay, again, I think you all covered it pretty well, but um, kind of just to build off that, I think just listen, especially if you, like me, are a white person in Maine, just like t zip it for a minute and listen to someone else, okay? <laughs> give, give more space for other people's experiences. We can't, we can't advocate for one another if we don't know what we need and we don't know what we need if we don't listen. So that's it. Well, thank you. I now open the floor to folks on the Biddeford campus and online to ask questions. We have two mics going around. So if you're interested, please raise your hand in asking a question. Uh, and we ask that you stand up and give a first name if possible. I have a smiley face at the end of this paragraph so that I remember to smile to like invite everyone to speak. All right. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Anthony Johnson. I'm on the Biddeford campus, and I just kind of wanted to ask, like, from the start, and this may sound really weird, but, like, from the start, like, did you coming into, like, college or high school or middle school or whatever, did you start, like, thinking that this is where you wanted to be, like, right now, like, at the state? Like, did you think this is, like, hey, like, when I grow up, I want to be this? Or is this something, like, you, as a long way you traveled from from the start, you like towards this goal. That makes sense. I think Tori made it clear she wanted to be a florist. So. <laughs> I was a baker for six years before this, so <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have a clue. Um, I think that uh, just letting the journey happen is a really important part of that. Is how it is for me. So I'm a little bit more. I've said before that I grew up in public service, so I knew I was probably going to do it. But career was actually no. Um, I'm a very ambitious person. I'm an environmental studies and marine affairs double major here. I'm a lot. I do a lot. I can tell that I'm a very ambitious person. Um, and people definitely like open their eyes and like give me big eyes and they're like, how do you manage everything with that? But I originally really wanted to go more into environmental science when I started um, and just focus on science and that stuff. Um, and then, you know, I was being dragged to the stuff and I was going to these events and going to that stuff when I was younger. Um, but it wasn't really something I was interested in until I hit, I think, high school. And I realized that I couldn't, I, I was science relied on math and I was not good at math. Um, and I realized I was really interested in people and history and literature and language and art um, and talking with people and understanding their experiences. And I realized I needed to find a way to balance it out. So that's really when I realized that my work I felt was less of the trajectory I was going for and realized, hey, I've this impact of being around public service and being around people impacted me more than I thought I was. And it's now really a steady thing for me that I want to be in public service. I don't know what trajectory my career will go. I don't know if I'll keep running for office. I don't know if I'll um, go in more like my father and go into the bureaucracy of it all um, or spending some time doing more community activism and organizing. But I know that giving back to my community is now something I realize that is such a fundamental part of me that I can't imagine doing anything else. And I think that's something that'll guide you. And I think that's part of it too. It's like sometimes you have to have a broad vision and the specific details you figure out as you come along because, you know, in this world, you can't plan anything anymore and you shouldn't. Um, you should just sometimes take when the wind flows you because you don't know what opportunities will come or, or what situations will cause you to start something new. When I was in college, I was like, how do I get better at skateboarding and get a girlfriend? I like didn't know, <laughs> like not at all. But at the same time, I was also like getting mad and building up my anger and my analysis about the things that I saw happening. So like, yes and no, but I, I had no idea what way was the best way to address those things. 
And I honestly feel really lucky that I didn't commit to like a long expensive grad program or something like that that would have like probably just put me in debt and like given me more like you know like um I, I'm I'm feel, I feel lucky that I instead kind of made my choices based off of like the people that I encountered that I felt like I connected with and I saw myself in and I think that's how I've ended up um just like immersed in organizing because I think organizers are the best people and like anyone can be an organizer and academics can be organizers too I don't mean to be dragging academics but um but I think it's like a really specific um a really specific path that is like overemphasized that like you don't have to take in order to know how to make change um so I think there was kind of a turning point for me when I was like am I gonna do that or am I gonna like do some unnamed other thing and I chose the like unnamed other thing and um yeah, I think I've heard from other folks that I've talked to as well, really just like gravitating towards the people who are doing something that like resonates with you and that makes you feel hopeful. That's kind of like how I unplan my life. <laughs> yeah, you know my answer already. I mean, <laughs> to, to keep all the way 100 with you, I didn't even want to run for city council. It wasn't something that I grew up saying, like, I'm going to be a public servant and I'm going to be on the council um that was a conversation i had with a lot of people that were like you would be great for it and i was like i would be terrible at it and here i am but uh yeah it was it wasn't something that i grew up wanting to do and being like in community activism wasn't something i grew up wanting to do um i was waiting tables for a really long time and i think like that i was just kind of floating i didn't really know where i was going or what i was doing i i graduated from college and was waiting tables and was kind of like where is my life gonna go i was at that point i think where you know you have no money and you're just trying to figure out am i moving am i not like I, all my friends are doing this stuff and they're all having like interviews where they're wearing suits and i'm like waiting tables am i doing something wrong like i had I had all of that. Um, and I think what's interesting is all my life experiences that I've had have somehow prepared me for where I am now, but it's nothing I ever thought about. It wasn't ever like when I was in middle school or high school or college, I was like, I'm going to like, you know, be on the council and be an activist. I was just having general life experiences that just came into play now, um, you know, now that I am somebody that is in that realm. So, you know, to answer your question, no, it, it was definitely something that that wasn't planned and never something that I saw for myself I, I'm being like the, in a front facing um, career or like in a career where I have to speak a lot. That wasn't something that I ever thought for myself. So um, great, great panel. Uh, Tom Clack from Environmental Studies. Um, very interesting to, to listen to you. Inspiring. Um, enjoyed it a lot. I want to ask you uh, or anybody really here in the audience to ref to circle back to Martin Luther King Jr is could you just anything that really stays with you inspires you words uh themes from his life that carry forward uh what what is it about uh, the legacy of martin luther king that really resonates with with you i'd love i'd love to hear those kinds of thoughts carrying it forward thank you um for me this has been quite an interesting martin luther king jr day this day is always a little bit tricky for me personally um for a number of reasons but i think when i think of his legacy and when i think about what that means for me um like to give you some context i normally try and spend that day doing a lot of self-care stuff for me and to not do any work um and it was brought to my attention that a local paper printed his speech and they redacted a lot of parts that were that were what's the word that they like were divisive they redacted a lot of divisive parts um and that was a big moment of calling them out, of being out, being on the phone with the editorial board and having a lot of back and forth. And I was looking at myself like, this, this is how I'm spending my MLK day? This is what it is? So I think about his legacy in terms of living his legacy really authentically. And the thing that's challenging for me in terms of his legacy is the fact that it's been his, so historically whitewashed. Um, and I, I always try and remind people that Martin Luther King Jr. was not liked by a lot of people. I mean, he was one of the most hated man, men in the country. 
over 50% of black people didn't like him over 70% of white people didn't like him. So he was not really this shining beacon of light and the shining star that I think a lot of people want him to be based on his legacy. He was really a radical activist and radical organizer that made a lot of people really upset. So I always try and make sure that if we are having a conversation about him, that we're having an authentic conversation about him. And we're not having the conversation that we have with a lot of black leaders in history of saying like, we're going to make them so likable that that you know they are our new shining star. I mean, even thinking of the fact of like, in a lot of places, there's an MLK Day of Service. That's what it's been turned into. Is it's it's a day of service now? Where like, yes, you may have the day off, but you're going to do something in your community. But the people leading these community efforts um, are white-led organizations with very little diversity and with very little black representation. So I personally have a really challenging relationship with the holiday as a black woman, as a radical black woman, um, and as a black woman who is seeing one of her black leaders being reduced to a day of service and being reduced to the quote about the, not the color of their skin, but the content of their character. And I I do think that um, color is important. You know, I think being a black woman is important. And I think that we, in a lot of ways, there, there was conversations around striving to not see color, but I want you to see my color. I want you to understand that I'm a black woman. And I want you to understand what that means, what that represents, the things that I have to deal with that you will never have to deal with, the things that I have to choose not to deal with or choose to deal with, like the thing with the Bangor Daily News. We're just going to say it out loud. We, everybody knows about it. It's fine. Um, so yeah, I you know the 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 MLK Day legacy for me is a challenging one as I try really hard in a country that is rapidly erasing history, specifically Black history, and it's starting in schools and it, we're calling it critical race theory instead of just American history. I'm I'm really challenged by this this holiday that happens every single year because every single year more and more of his true legacy is erased. So I think as a Black woman, it's really important for me to walk in alignment with the real Dr. King, who was a very unapologetic Black person that was um, anti-capitalistic and anti I, um, you know, I, I, I think I just think of him as a person that was not your best friend. And um, and I want to really honor that true legacy of of who he was. So not sure if that answered your question specifically, but that's how I feel about Dr. King. And that's how I feel about the day. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I appreciate all that. And for me, something um, like a principle that that he like taught of the way that he thought about nonviolence, I think is one of those things that like gets whitewashed and gets like misunderstood. Because um, when we hear the word nonviolence, we're like, oh, like pacifism and like civility, which like to me is a really triggering word that makes me mad. Like, um, but like the way that um, the way that I learned like how MLK talked about nonviolence was that like conflict is a tool to like actually surface what we need to surface um and like if i'm seeing an injustice and i'm seeing my friends get systematically murdered and i'm not doing anything about it like that's not nonviolent. that's like complicit um so the way that um the way that he like taught and talked about nonviolence was very much like lean into conflict conflict is I'm quoting someone and I can't remember their name, but conflict is the spirit of the relationship asking itself to deepen. So if we're looking for interpersonal healing or healing in our organizations or in our like historically racist institutions or in our country, we need to lean into those conflicts and see where they lead us. Um, and that's something that I try to follow every day um, when I'm organizing or when I'm talking to people in my life. Um, and yeah. Hi, my name is Miranda Caraba, and my question is more on like the mental health side of things because personally for me, I'm like constantly angry at the world and just all the injustices and I'm definitely not as deep into the issues as you guys are. So just how do you deal with that anger if you have that constant anger? It's really interesting because this, I'm glad that a lot of now conversations are bringing have about the idea of like false positivity because I think that is a problem um that we've kind of shifted around and said well you have to be positive 100% of the time which does not work it's just not how it is and any negative emotions are bad um I don't remember what quote it was exactly um and I don't remember who it was from but I know there was a quote that we're talking about that you know the idea of going back to the idea of the nonviolence and doing something about it it's like righteous anger is 
normal and it's important to have it's important to feel grief it's important to feel anger um, it's important to feel those emotions because if you don't feel those emotions then you don't get the full human experience as painful as they are because being part of human is dealing with the happinesses and the joys but also dealing with the sorrows and the things that make you angry so sometimes you the ways to deal with it sometimes are finding ways to let out that anger and righteous anger in possible when you're like if I do this now, I'm going to regret it later. So I'm like finding ways to get rid of it in, or get use it in ways that are either transformative, creative is good for me. I love writing. Writing is definitely a way for me to get it out because I'm like, I want to shout at this person, but then I'm going to make the situation a thousand times worse, even if I want to get out the emotion. So I'm like, I'll respond into more of a a tone that I wish I didn't have to respond into, but I wouldn't get anything done. And then I'm like, when I get home later, I'm going to be writing and put on the most loudest, angriest music and just let out all the feelings I wish I had, um, which is sometimes just the idea of striking the balance of it, which is, is the hard part. Cause you're like, you know, when is it the time that you feel like you want to like break through the barriers and just not give a damn. And then others, when you're like, well, if you do that for me, it's like, am I going to hurt the people who are behind me by me not thinking of them in this moment? And the person who's on the other side is going to shut down the conversation and not allow what's actually going to happen. And I'm going to let the people down behind me um, and just finding productive ways to let out those negative emotions because we're human. We're going to have to deal with them. The world is unfortunately a very unjust place and we're going to feel those senses of anger. And sometimes it's finding the productive ways of doing it, either productive through the activism or productive through times that you can take off of the activism that you need to recharge yourself with. Um, yeah, for me, I've had to fight really hard to like embrace my anger and see it as a tool. And once I started doing that, I like started to feel better. And it's it's hard because I think so many of us, especially if we're like raised as women or if we're like a brown person growing up around mostly white people, which was my case, my anger, I was taught from an early age was something that was like so out of bounds and like so inappropriate and dangerous and that I would be like outcast and like demonized. And I think probably every single person, no matter what your identities are, has experienced that to some degree because this is a culture in the US for the most part where like anger is not appropriate to show. Um, and and yeah, like, like I love that we talk at the Worker Center about like we're just angry workers because like if we weren't angry, like, what are we there for? Like, so it's, um, yeah, I think like learning how to embrace it and learn from it. And I think if you're someone who likes reading Audre Lord, or like you can listen to her speaking on YouTube or podcast too, like has a lot of really awesome ways to explain like how she learns to use her anger as a tool and embrace it and see what it can teach you. So I've found a lot of inspiration in that. Um, and yeah, I think it's also like part of why anger is so important is, um, since the 70s our social movements and movements to change the stuff that we're angry about have been kind of like depoliticized and like non-profitized and like institutionalized in this like oh like we'll hire a diversity officer like we'll like hire someone to deal with that um and that's been really harmful to our progress and that's part of why things are getting worse and we're also burnt out and tired right now um and i think that we need to really reclaim back this sort of like like attack and like um, be angry and demand and take power um, that our that like our friends in like the global south are doing better than us and that we can learn a lot from and like finding ways that like we really do need to like be pushing it to the next level and like trying new tactics that are more like controversial and will be called divisive and will be called uncivil because that's what people have always done to give us the freedoms that we have now um, and embracing anger and normalizing anger is such a critical part of that. I'd like to place my question firmly here, like Tom did in the Martin Luther King um, celebration that we're having. And we are almost three years out from the summer of 2020, which was notable not just for the pandemic, but because of the, the uh, Black Lives Matter protests all over the country. I would really like to hear your impressions, and not everybody has to answer it, but if you have some insight into where we are almost three years later in terms of um, justice and uh, particularly dismantling systemic racism because um, I think it was really that summer that a lot of people became aware that this isn't a one-on-one -on -one personal bias problem it's a systemic problem not you guys obviously but a lot of the general public um where are we 2023 January um if I had to give us a grade as a country on where we are we'd be like a D like a D minus. We're not failing, but we're we're right above failing. I, I think that um 
when I think about the Black Lives Matter movement of 2020, which felt like a moment that everyone uh, suddenly recognized systemic racism and was using words like DEI and was suddenly, um, I think, aware of the the struggles and the disenfranchisement of specifically Black Americans. Everybody was on board for that uh, in 2020. But if I have to fast forward now to 2023, I mean, I think it was like a summer project for a lot of people. I think it was like a summer, pro this is what I, ha this is how I spent my summer was doing DEI, Black Lives Matter work. I'm gonna shop at black stores. I'm gonna repost everything a black person says. I'm a DM. I mean, I got a lot of DMs from people that were bullying me in high school. I'm seeing a nodding head over there. So you feel that. Yeah, that was weird. Right. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot. You don't have to answer. But that was weird for me. I got a lot of DMs from people that were like, sorry, I was racist to you in high school. I was going through a lot. And I was like, same. Um, so, you know, I <laughs> I think uh, where we are now, it's tough because it was a theme. I think it was the theme of the summer of 2020. Nobody was going out. Everybody was staying in their homes. So because of that, people were forced to pay attention more than they ever had before because everything kind of felt like it was on pause. We didn't know what we were doing. And suddenly we were like, here's a thing that's really bad. And we're going to pour all of our energy into it for eight weeks. We're going to do a solid eight weeks and we're going to do everything we can. And then we're going to kind of pull it back. Um, and there are studies that show that the trend in terms of Black Lives Matter has gone down significantly in the past three years. So the people in organizing spaces um, that have been about this life prior to 2020, because this for many of us was not our first rodeo, we're still out here working and we're still doing a lot of grassroots organizing, but the DEI work has depleted. Um, you know, the, the phrasing of Black Lives Matter, I think, is really depleted. And I think it's because, like you said, it's actually a systemic issue. It's not a one to one personal issue. So I think people thought, like, I'm going to be nice to black people. And it's going to be fine. It's going to be solved. But we're not diving actually into the issue of systemic oppression that this country was built on. And that, I think, involves a lot of uh, transfers of power. I think that involves a lot of wealth distribution to historically uh, disenfranchised communities that are low income. I think that involves a lot of power being transferred at the level of decision making within policy. So those are real things that I think we could do that would actually help uplift black communities and poor communities. But I just did a talk on this the other day and this feels it's like giving a little bit of like morbid realness. I just don't think that we're ever going to get there because we've never been there. So like we can we can do everything we want to do to say we're going to champion for black people. But if we are not making systemic changes in terms of wealth and in terms of housing and in terms of climate, in terms of just our economic statuses, we're not actually going to do anything. We're like scooping off like the icing of the cake, but we're not like cutting into the cake and finding the actual issues. So, you know, I, I'm always really happy to see how many people are still trying their best to get involved at the systemic levels to make changes within their workspaces and within their personal spaces. But if it's not a full radical transfer of power and if it's not a full distribution of wealth that is being held by the top 1% of this country, I don't really think that we're going to get anywhere. Um, and so, you know, thinking about Black Lives Matter from 2020 to 2023, we all knew that this was going to happen and that it was on trend for a little while. And then we've kind of hit the hit the downslope. So that's the unfortunate part. But I think the fortunate part, again, is that we have a lot of people that are this is their life. So this is what they're going to build their life doing. Um, you know, and my hope is that it it doesn't take another mass pandemic slash horrible tragedy that everybody is looking at um, for people to start getting involved. I hope that we're just continuing to get involved because since George Floyd's murder, we've had a ton of other murders of black individuals at the hand at the hands of police officers or white vigilantes. Not much has changed in that realm. So we need to look at wealth distribution. We need to look at uh, mass decarceration and we need to look at full abolition and uh, defunding and dismantling of the police department before we can really get any further yeah i agree with the morbid realness and i think that um i'll just add 
a brief thing that like part of what we need to do, especially as like white people or brown people wanting to be in solidarity with Black Lives Matter is like do our own debrief of that and like, okay, why did that lose so much steam? Why did people stop showing up? And what can we learn from that to do it different next time? Or what are the ways that like the powers that be kind of like were able to co-opt and take that momentum and make it into something that sounded good but didn't actually do any power distribution? I think it's super important to learn and debrief that. Um, and then on the local level, something that is like still going that I'll plug, um, Maine Youth Justice as a campaign led by um, young people in the um, the like greater, I think just generally Southern Maine area um, who've been formerly incarcerated in Long Creek, which is the last youth prison in Maine. And they're campaigning to end youth incarceration in Maine. And there's only about 30 young people left in Long Creek, which is still too many, but they've like they've had a campaign going since I think about 2019 and they definitely need a lot of people's help in the community to push the narrative of that campaign and get support in the legislature. So that's something that like, if you're like, oh, how do I like show back up again that you can definitely get involved in. I'll say is also support Maine Youth Justice. I got involved with them through their climate justice event. Um, the Maine Educators Environmental did a change makers organization, which was wonderful to meet a bunch of young people doing basically community organizing but focusing on climate justice and sustainability and changing food systems and that kind of focus and changing how we think of what it means to be environmental and that's more my perspective so just that that's the point like support it's back to the listen thing again sometimes it's just not about you it's just listening to others and allowing them to have the space that historically they've never had the ability to or just keeps getting co-opted in the Thank you folks for joining us today. I want to make sure that we have time for if anybody wants to linger around, our panelists will be here. Uh, the conversation does not stop here. Um, just to shamelessly plug on the at back of the pamphlet, the Center for Excellence and Collaborative Education will be hosting a conversation cafe on Monday, January 30th at 6.30. There will be snacks and refreshments there along with our panelists if you'd like to continue this conversation, but remember that you have the choice to make the community a better one. Thank you and have a lovely Wednesday.